two, one. Welcome to Sounding Point Podcast. And today I am pleased to welcome Daniel Lelchuk on the podcast. Daniel is the assistant principal cellist in the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra. He is concertized throughout the world, including his visiting cellist with the Qatar Philharmonic and principal cellist of the Castleton Festival Orchestra in their production of La Boheme at the Muscat Royal Opera House in Oman. Daniel is a founding member of the Castleton Chamber Players in Rappahannock County, Virginia, along with Eric Zilberger, who is also soon going to be a guest on the podcast. In addition to his activities as a cellist, Daniel hosts Talking Beats podcast, where he interviews high-profile guests on fields ranging from international foreign policy to Shakespeare to food. Deeply involved in the food world, he has also interviewed many famous chefs for TV and radio. Today, I've asked Daniel here because he wrote a widely seen and shared article in Quillette, which in turn responds to a recent Vox piece entitled How Beethoven's Fifth Symphony Put Classism in Classical Music. So Daniel, thank you so much for joining me today. Nice to be here. Um, <clears throat> it's funny because we um, went to Castleton festival together back in 2012 we didn't really um run into each other that much there at the festival but i'm, I'm looking forward to uh, sharing some of our experiences uh, working with lauren mazel and and just sort of the uh, amazing influence he had but but first we have uh, some other things to get to <laughs> um so this piece by vox it's um it's the authors are nate sloan and charlie harding They released this article as kind of a companion to some of these podcasts that they did, um, speaking about Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and kind of approaching cultural issues around the piece. And I think it was, well, we're going to get into it. I don't want to give too much away right now, but as you can tell from the title, I think they use this very contemporary device of politicizing something about which politics has not traditionally um, had very much to say. Um, And I think it was troubling to a lot of uh, musicians and music lovers and artists in in various ways um, for some of the conflations they made. And, um, you know, and I want to be fair to them and and, uh, present what they said and see if they have anything uh, reasonable to say. But... uh, I think we've both uh, kind of struggled with this, uh, the ideas presented in this article, to put it lightly. Um, well, I haven't struggled at all. Let, let, let me say. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I, I, I haven't struggled at all. I, it's actually extremely clear. The, the, I, I mean, there, there's, there's no, when, when you think about the perversion of the idea of a Beethoven symphony, and you think about manufacturing artificial political narratives to go along with it, there's nothing to, be confused about in a sense i'm only confused about what took them so long (laughs) yes okay that is a a much better way of saying it and uh i agree fully um i put out a poll on my various social media uh before this interview with the goal of um you know in in fair uh in a spirit of dialogue seeing well is there anyone out there in my circle who does feel that Beethoven's Fifth Symphony reeks of classism or elitism or makes them feel unwelcome. And I don't think any of them even got any likes. <laughs> I don't think any of them got any responses whatsoever. So uh, it was crickets on that end. Uh, okay, so so the thing is, all you have to do is read the comments on the Vox article. <laughs> and all you have to do is read the comments on my article uh, all over uh, hundreds, if not thousands of comments on the Quillette site, also on Twitter, on Facebook. It's been shared many times. The whole point is I think people are just wondering why there's yet another piece of beauty, of aesthetic yeah. beauty, that they're being told they're not allowed to like. Now, it's very interesting that they began this crusade using Beethoven as the focal point, Beethoven, just to give a little background. So we know Beethoven was in a very regressive time. He was actually quite progressive. Uh, he was 
uh, quite democratic. He had certain ideals that he adhered to, the famous case of originally dedicating the Third Symphony, mm-hmm. Aroca, to Napoleon. And when he was informed by his secretary, this is written down, we have written record, that in fact, Napoleon was not an anti-monarchical figure, but had just declared himself emperor. Beethoven tears up mm-hmm. the dedication page. Beethoven was also deaf, uh, quite deaf. By the time he wrote the Fifth Symphony, uh, he was a, a disabled, uh, living in squalor, according to many accounts, an extremely difficult existence. Uh, it was turned into a perversion yes. uh, by the writers at the pop music staff at Vox. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think a lot of people were writing online, wait a minute, I've liked this piece my whole life. You're, you're telling me I, I can't like it anymore? It's a symphony. Now, again, to go back to, to where they started was with Beethoven. So remember, this isn't an opera. There are no words. There is no uh, supremacist Teutonic undertone that you can find in a Wagner opera and, and have something really interesting to talk about. Uh, I, I happen to think that Wagner's music needs to be played because it's great music. Uh, of course, he had some despicable views, uh, but uh, it's ironic that, that by the way, the most famous interpreter of Wagner during his lifetime was his good friend, the Jewish son of a rabbi, uh, conductor Herman Levy, H-E-R-M-A-N-N-L-E-V-I, uh, obviously, Jews have been maybe the most famous Wagner interpreters uh, in the past 50 or 75 years. So the idea of not playing someone's music because the artist has reprehensible views doesn't hold much water. But why Beethoven? As far as we know, he didn't have reprehensible views. As far as we know, it was simply a way of taking a piece that is the most famous, the most performed, the most popular symphony of all time, literally all over the world, played, loved all over the world by millions of people, maybe hundreds of millions by this point. It's been 200 and something years. It's played on every continent uh, and saying, look, this is the root of evil. This piece is where we must throw our attention. There is a sinister background to this symphony. I read it and I almost thought it was a parody, but like many (laughs) things which you think are a parody and you think will be left off the playground, you wake up the next day and like an avalanche, it's become true. Yeah. I've, I, you have that uh, section later in your article where you're talking about um, how there's certain pieces of art that are so universal and so almost cornerstone to our civilization. Um, you, they, the authors almost pay this backhanded compliment to Beethoven that in our modern time of of questioning everything, of of undermining our own foundations, that they really can't get around Beethoven in, do, in doing so. That our entire self concept, Beethoven is part of that. The idea is to somehow lay blame of the entire history of classical music, the entire history of European and, by extension, American uh, musical culture at the feet of Beethoven. Of course. Classical music, like all fields, has issues to deal with. Uh, but but the, the last thing that seems to be an issue that needs dealing with is the creation of a symphony by Beethoven. I'll, I'll cite a couple examples, for, for instance, comments that I got. I got many emails to my personal email, but there were also, as I mentioned, hundreds, if not thousands of comments on Twitter and the Quillet page. Someone wrote saying, I'm from a very small town in Chile. And I grew up with Beethoven's Fifth as the piece. It gave me life. It made me love classical music. It was the only thing that kept me grounded. So are these people from Vox saying to this person from a small town in Chile uh, that the piece that defined his childhood, that gave his childhood meaning, that brought life and love into his existence is invalid? Uh, It's laughable. Uh, There was also the comment on one of the many Facebook shares by a gentleman who knew a famous conductor uh, in China who was executed, who had committed one of a number of crimes. Uh, One of them was listening to the music of Beethoven, Mm. uh, the bourgeois uh, Western music of Beethoven. uh, and, And he said that it 
made his life worth living, and he was humming tunes from the Mesa Solemnis on the way to his execution. Uh, the Afghan Women's Orchestra programming Beethoven 9 and uh, Afghani traditional music on a concert tour they took through Europe. So you see all of these cases in diverse places around the world where the authors who form part of the pop music staff at Vox try to invalidate people's experiences with a Beethoven symphony. And they use a rather Trumpian method, by the way, of saying, quote, many people. Many right. people are yes. saying. I, uh, um, what did you uh, think of that? Did you know? Did you notice that? It's a sort of very vague many people. Uh, <laughs> I, I wanted to ask, who are these many people? Because the yes. thousands and hundreds of people commenting to me, as the public can see, are the many people who actually have names who have found their lives to be immeasurably enriched Absolutely. by this music. I was abs I was fascinated by that interesting device, which was this anonymity of the uh, those oppressed by Beethoven. Um, <laughs> and yet your specificity, even in your article about um, the people from all over the world who have expressed this deep love of Beethoven and his his impact on their lives in this incredibly positive way. And I definitely want to ask about the backlash or, or sort of the, um, the response to this. But first, I thought it would be a good segue to actually go into the article where that idea, that anonymous, um, that anonymous um, oppression is first uh, expressed. So here's the title of the article, How Beethoven's Fifth Symphony Put the Classism in Classical Music. Uh, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, I'm not going to read the whole thing, <laughs> starts with an anguished opening theme, dun, 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 and ends with a glorious major key melody. Since its 1808 premiere, audiences have interpreted that progression from struggle to victory as a metaphor for Beethoven's personal resilience in the face of his oncoming deafness, or rather that's been long been the popular read among those in power, especially the wealthy white men who embraced Beethoven and turned his symphony into a symbol of their superiority and importance. Okay, well, so we can get into that in a second. <laughs> For some in other groups, women, LGBTQ plus people, people of color, Beethoven's symphony may be predominantly a rem reminder of classical music's history of exclusion and elitism. So that's a very large claim to make to then say some people. <laughs> let's have some specifics who on earth is this you see you see the, the the whole idea is that that as i said before there's a lot of issues with classical music uh it's it's a worthwhile exercise to look at what repertoire we play why do we play it there's a lot of composers a lot of black composers a lot of women composers who write great music whose music is yes. never played so yeah so so there's there's sort of valid things to talk about yeah, when it comes to classical music, uh, but but when you bring in something as ridiculous as that, uh, that the idea now just to look at it very carefully, the the authors somehow imply that there's something made up about Beethoven struggling through deafness to try to write the symphony that it starts off foreboding in this minor key, ends in ends in a triumphant C major, that that is actually a manufactured narrative by white, rich men. It, there's something very odd about that. that. There's nothing made up. That's actually what happened, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. he was going deaf. He moved yeah. uh, apartments, I think, 58 times. He did live quite a difficult life, uh, quite a tortured life. Uh, there's no made-up narrative here. Uh, that it's, it's If you want to have some stereotypical... Uh, powerful white male Beethoven is hardly the person you would you would elevate to that position. But we're not talking about a Napoleon here. And I mean, even the premiere, right, of this uh, this piece. T tell us about was... the premiere. I'm I'm curious. I think a lot of people don't know w what happened at the premiere. What was going on so, at the premiere? I believe it was. I I uh, I researched it yesterday I, I should have written it down i believe it was 1808 in the uh, the theater on um under veen under veen under veen so um in vienna beethoven rented out this hall 
and he had very great difficulty in doing so because there were better connected composers and uh, presenters who got all the sweet spots. So he got this hall out, out of the outskirts of uh, the city, and it was a winter day. Um, basically, the clientele, the, the concert going public, um, basically, there was a short window of... Um, of time you could do it in Vienna because um, people would leave the city in the nice weather. They would go um, out to the countryside during the nice weather. So they were only in the city in the winter. Um, and he basically had this very small window of time to uh, to put out this premiere. And in fact, at this concert, at this extremely poorly heated, uh, drafty concert hall in the middle of winter in Vienna, um, it was a program that lasted approximately four hours. Um, his fifth and sixth symphonies held, had their premiere there. His choral fantasy had its premiere there. I believe his fourth um, piano concerto also had its premiere there. Um, it was a four-hour concert in dead cold. The orchestra had to restart the choral fantasy because uh, they only only had one rehearsal beforehand. <laughs> and uh, Beethoven gave a, a piano solo. Um, even though he was, you know, his encroaching deafness was approaching the point where it was very difficult for him to perform. So, so it doesn't, it doesn't reek of elitism, <laughs> the, the circumstances under which that, um, symphony premiered. In fact, it has something more of the hero's struggle through something difficult into great glory. So the thing is, uh, what you're describing is is often for Beethoven. He had a lot of these instances that were not particularly uh, enjoyable events. But I, I think the the bigger picture you have to look towards is is what happens. This is something I mentioned in the article, uh, which is taken issue with by the pop music staff at Vox, and they they seem to wonder at. I don't know if you have the article there in front of you. I yeah. don't. I, I've seen it enough. Once was enough. Uh, but, <laughs> Uh, but the the idea that when someone's personal story becomes our collective story, uh, and they view this as a sort of novel idea, that's what happens with any work of art that, as I write, gets an mm -hmm. outsized amount of fame and influence. Mm -hmm. The perception changes, the way a piece is viewed changes, the way it's heard changes. Uh, so to somehow lay the blame on Beethoven, uh, again, it's very strange if you have uh, War and Peace by Tolstoy uh, as the favorite book of some neo-Nazi clan member in the middle of Missouri, and he reads it to his family every night. I, I don't blame Tolstoy for the fact uh, that, that, that his book made it into uh, evil hands. Okay, so, so the question is, what, what do we interpret from the music? I want to say one thing about about the piece, because I think a lot of people, including the two pop music writers at Vox, uh, they mentioned the beginning, the famous ba 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 ba, and then the mention of beam 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 bum bum bum, the big triumphant. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a lot that happens in between. Uh, the slow movement, the andante, is one of the most moving. You know, one of the most moving pieces ever written in music. One of the most tender pieces. Beethoven mm -hmm. is one of the great writers of slow movements. Beethoven is one of the great writers of atmospheric. There's nothing like a middle Beethoven slow movement, which is exactly what this is. Uh, the kicking of the musical material, the kicking to the side by the pop music writers at Vox, uh, it does a real disservice both to Beethoven, but he doesn't particularly need them to help him but but it does it <laughs> it does a disservice to all of the people who read that article who maybe wondered wait a minute what have i been missing in this symphony so mm. so when you actually don't address music at all when it's a piece that's supposed to be about music purportedly written by a musicologist by pop music experts uh you ask yourself well what was the point of this piece if there's nothing about music about it? Let's just talk about the music for a second. Yeah. Because I think it was lost on a lot of people that Beethoven in this symphony was writing music for string players and wind and brass players to assemble on stage and play. 
Uh, mm-hmm. As I said before, it's not an opera. There's no lyrics. So, so we evaluate it musically. It's a great symphony that goes without saying. Uh, mm-hmm. It is not a symphony filled with aggression. It has aggressive elements, uh, but then again, so does the magic flute. Uh, every piece has variety. There's no piece that's completely uh, serene, uh, a symphony from, from start to finish. So it has aggressive elements. It has non-aggressive elements. It has beautiful has lyrical elements, lyrical and beauty and everything in between. So all that the pop music staff at Vox was doing uh, by highlighting simply the beginning uh, was trying to box in the symphony to the opening few bars of music, which is, yeah, what everybody in the world can sing. But there's a lot of other elements to the symphony that were just totally kicked aside. It makes you ask yourself, how much do people like the pop music staff of Vox who wrote the article actually care about music, uh, it seems very little based on skimming the article, having to read it. I'm afraid I had to actually read it. Uh, I couldn't just <laughs> I'm sorry. It. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, too. Uh, and, and having to listen to some of the podcasts. I, I'm telling you, I was contacted by so many people who are, and again, this is not a, a political issue. This is not a left-right issue. This is not, if you're right of center you love or hate Beethoven. If you're left of center, you. Yeah, exactly. this, this is so not a political thing. But again, yeah. like 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 everything, they fell into the trap of perversion. It's a perversion of the music. So I, I heard from so many people, as you know, let's face it, most musicians tend to be quite on the left politically, uh, some on the right and some in the middle and some are what we call apolitical. So I heard from so many people from across the spectrum, but mainly people very extreme left to center saying, what were they thinking going after a Beethoven symphony? It's like there was Mm -hmm. a befuddlement in the air that was just hard to believe. And again, I, I just want people to really understand what is the best way to disprove this article? in Vox by the pop music staff. The best way is to put on the damn symphony <laughs> and listen to it. Exactly. Right? <laughs> mm-hmm. exactly. I think also that it's such a, a uniquely horrible example to use, uh, to prove the point they're trying to prove because the music of, as you were saying, the concern of a symphony is musical. It is a, a statement of musical thought. Unlike an opera, which has stage elements, text elements, a symphony is entirely musical. And a symphony lives and dies on the strength of its musical material. The idea that that symphony is famous because of some gatekeepers and of, you know, these elitist gatekeepers decided it is and not because it's legitimately unforgettable music and has been no has been recognized as such. Um since its beginning, it, it indicates that they're not um, evaluating it from a musical point of view. They're evaluating it from this critical theory point of view, um, which um, I think it goes to a couple interesting issues in classical music in general, which, as you and I know, you know, you're, you know you're currently playing in an orchestra. I've played in orchestras my whole life. Um, symphonies program Beethoven every single season and you know we're all better for it it's incredible music but why to please the elites no those are the concerts that get the most people coming <laughs> right it's not just the elite I'm glad, I'm glad you brought this up you're actually hitting on one of the things that, that I'm going to be writing about soon uh, which is that this is a myth that classical music is elitist. It's a total myth. It's actually the other way around. It's actually, it's actually, (laughs) you can get tickets to many orchestras for cheaper than you can see a movie. By the way, if people still remember what movie theaters are, they (laughs) they used to exist and you used to buy tickets and go sit in a big room and watch a film with a lot of other people. I guarantee you by the time you buy a Coke and a pack of Twizzlers, 
you could have seen Beethoven five, two or three times in cheap seats at many symphonies in this country. I guarantee it. Otherwise, sure. write me and I'll buy you a ticket when they're, <laughs> when they're <laughs> going to play it next. But the idea that classical music is elitist and there are these gatekeepers, it is just I, – I, I understand why it's there, but it's just wildly outdated. We have to look at where we are in 2020. Let's just say we're in – February or the beginning of March 2020, pre-pandemic. We don't need to talk about COVID right now. That's a whole different conversation. This is a very different experience than what these pop music writers at Vox are describing. The elitism that they allude to, that they talk about, I think was prevalent in classical music at a certain time. Uh, early 20th century, the middle of the century. I, I don't think it's been there for decades. It is not some sort of a uh, social statement where all the rich and powerful go and hang out at intermission at the symphony during a Mahler performance. It isn't mm -hmm. like that anymore. I think, I think musicians have to do a stronger job of saying to their friends and saying to the public, classical music isn't elitist. That is how it used to be. That's just a myth. It's a myth. Uh, the people who are most excited when a Beethoven fifth is played, frankly, are young people. Mm -hmm. uh, let's be very clear. I, I, I played this piece at least once a year, literally. Mm -hmm. When do my young, I mean, young under 50, I'm talking about maybe even under 40. When when do those people want to come to the symphony? They want to come to hear Beethoven 5. They want to come because it's iconic. They want to come to hear Beethoven 5 because they know it's that kind of experience that's going to leave them a changed person. They ask me, they say, when are you playing Beethoven 5? I say, it's in a few months. They say, when can I get tickets? Mm -hmm. We do tickets. They come, their lives are changed. This is the thing that people get wrong. They think it's elitist and these these gatekeepers, whoever these people are. Beethoven 5 is what actually brings in the people who would never go to the symphony if Beethoven 5 weren't on the program. Let's get it straight, you know? Yeah. I uh, had Lydia Yankowski on a few episodes ago. Um, she's a conductor, fantastic opera conductor, also a Castleton alumna. Um, now, we had an interesting talk, which brought up the same the same topic of how symphony orchestras and it's kind of a good problem to have but we struggle with it we um it's a balance with an orchestra because the pieces that get the big audience numbers are beethoven 5 maybe maybe mahler now but more it's more beethoven and mozart and the the chess, the war horses right um, that so-called, right? They're, they're greatest piece of music. That's why people love them. But, um, right. So that's the pieces that get the ticket sales, but then obviously we want a, a thriving art form with new composers and, and new voices and everything. So it's a challenge on the symphonies and as it should be, uh, it's a challenge of all the music organizations to keep promoting a thriving, um, um, uh, up and coming, living composer wave right which does not have the audience at the moment right the least elitist part of classical music at the time at right now is still beta it's still those old um composers that it's almost the audience understands that's what they find there you go to the art museum you, you expect van gogh you go to the symphony you expect beethoven and that's part of the legacy it's it's here to stay as long as orchestras are around. But then, you know, we have we have this other challenges with bringing new composers in and and getting their names recognized, getting their music, you know, recognized. But anyway, that my point was just that the the leveling of that charge of elitism at Beethoven in particular makes no sense. And, and talk about kicking a man while he's down. The poor guy's celebrating his 250th anniversary, right? <laughs> <laughs> Born in, exactly. the, in December 1770, by the way. Yeah. So, so, so keep at it, pop yeah. music. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's another thing. I think that's just a, an obvious a reason for this article, which is 
something that classical musicians also struggle with. And that is how do you, it's not just classical musicians, it's every industry. How do you get attention on what you're doing? Um, news organizations, media, uh, cable, television, all of these old institutions are experiencing um, sort of the shift away from the old gatekeeper. <laughs> and uh, now you have um, major newspapers folding and basically giant organizations that once held a monopoly on the American media and world media now are struggling to find audiences, struggling to find eyes. Their audiences are no longer captive. People can choose where they um, consume their media. So how do you get eyes? And now this is the age of clickbait, where in order to forward your media empire or whatever you call it, in order to keep your job as a journalist or a, an opinion writer, you have to frame everything you do in such a way that is sensationalized and emotionally charged. It's a desire to be seen at no matter what the cost. Well, there's a sensationalistic aspect, but sensationalism can also be uh, directed and channeled in in a good way. Look, uh, look at the title of my piece, Then They Came for yeah. Beethoven. You could say that's a sensationalistic title, but it's also true because they're coming yeah. for Beethoven. Yes, you see, <laughs> so, so uh, I mean, the amount of clicks that, that my piece got, I think, is indicative of, of first of all, people were just shocked. They read, I, I, I'm, people, I don't mean, we're not talking musicians here. Musicians are, are, are just a, a tiny slice of the populace. We're talking general public to whom Beethoven, to whom classical music means something that ranges from maybe they hear, hear it occasionally in an elevator to they're passionate about the symphony as much as you or I. So there's a huge range. But the general populace, they see this headline, then they came for Beethoven. They're like, wait, what did Beethoven do wrong? <laughs> He's like, yeah. So, so, yes, a lot of people clicked on my article because I think they they thought that maybe there would be some newly revealed uh, indictments on the person mm -hmm. that is Beethoven. Yep. Instead, you read it, you're like, wait a minute. So, what am I supposed to get out of this again? Because <laughs> because there's there's very little about Beethoven. Let's let's look. There's very little about Beethoven in the piece or the podcast. Mm -hmm. There's very little about music. Mm -hmm. There's very little about the state of orchestras right now. So why are these two pop music staff members talking about this again? You know what 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 is this all about? It's are, because it's it is the mo one of the most iconic pieces of music of all time exactly and you're, and, you're not going yeah. you're not going to get as much of a of a sensation if you're like the problematic music of richard wagner we're like well, oh really I, <laughs> he was problematic <laughs> i had no idea no I, it's you're not you know you'll see I, I i think there's there's going to be an interesting interesting discussion about wagner soon and and that's a discussion i really looking looking forward yeah. to thinking my teeth into because Have, it, are have you gotten Wagnerism, Alex Alex Ross's book? I'm I'm familiar with the book. Uh, we're going to be talking soon, Alex Ross and myself. But 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 beyond that, there's a long history of that. That's that's the latest in in the line of of many many pieces addressing Wagner, addressing Wagner's music, uh, in the context of when it was written, in the context of now. Uh, the the common refrain to link Wagner to Hitler is is dumb. It's it's just dumb. It, I, you, you cannot blame Wagner because in the next century, uh, a horrible, evil man happened to like his music. As far as we know, by the way, there's no there's no written record uh, of, of Hitler actually writing about Wagner. So the links are even tenuous. We know we like the music. Right. The Nazis love Beethoven five too. Yeah. Uh, they they love Beethoven nine too. Uh, you know, there's, there's the famous uh, recordings. So did the Allies. So did, so did the Allies exactly. But <laughs> but that doesn't matter. No one cares about that. <laughs> uh, I mean, the famous wartime recordings of of Furtwängler conducting the Beethoven Fifth. Uh, I I believe even shaking Goebbels' hand. You know, uh, mm. I I happen to feel very much that is a mistake and quite an unfortunate picture to be floating around of Furtwängler and Goebbels. On the other hand, 
what real music lover doesn't take Furt Wengler highly seriously? What real music lover would say, here is a list of the recordings I love, and there would be no recordings by... I'm going to name a few conductors now, so people who are listening, you <laughs> get, get, get out the notepad, okay? <laughs> oh, yeah. Carl Boom, Herbert von Karajan, Wilhelm Furtwängler. I'm going to keep going. Those are the three most famous. Clem, Clemens Krauss. That's Clemens with a C and Krauss with a K. Hans Knappertsbusch, K-N-A-P-P-E-R-T-S-B-U-S-C-H. H-A-N-S is the first name, by the way. The list goes on and on and on of yep. conductors. Also soloists. Many, many fewer soloists. It's interesting. Many of the soloists at that time were, uh, were, were not uh, German. German never, Germany also mm-hmm. never produced the caliber of soloists that, that came from Russia. Uh, but uh, a lot of the you conductors. Had, I mean, um, I, I suppose Elizabeth... Uh, Schwarzkopf. Well, if maybe. you're talking singers, if you're talking yeah. singers, sure. But we're talking instrumental solos, then no. And so, how could you possibly think that you really have a good understanding of musical history if you refuse to listen to conductors or, who or, had bad associations? Richard Strauss, same thing. Not to mention Strauss. So, <laughs> so this whole idea is is artifice. It's artifice, and it's. Yes, it, um, Alex Ross brings it up in the book Wagnerism. That's really cool. You're talking to him. I'd love. I, that's a dream of mine to talk to him. But um, he brings it up that, but with both Nietzsche and Wagner, um, both of the men certainly had reprehensible views and very questionable philosophy. Right? Wagner's pamphlet on Judaism, his frequent anti-Semitic statements, and Nietzsche's kind of. Uh, mechanistic uh, utilitarian view of human morality don't look good especially in their uh in their uh sorry my phone adoption by later the nazi regime but it is odd looking at that um history because you see them now through the prism of what happened after them well, well, that, that, that's one way of looking at it. But another simpler way for me is to say, is to say, okay, I can read their views. I, I can, I don't, I'm not qualified to comment on Nietzsche. I, I, I know enough about Wagner to, okay, we, we read right. jewelry in music, uh, the famous essay. Uh, but then we ask ourselves, well, how come one of his best friends, Herman Levy, the son of a rabbi, was the most famous Wagner interpreter in his lifetime? And, and he wrote in a letter, Levy did, to his rabbi father, I'm so lucky to know such a magical man as Wagner. You see, so so we tend to superimpose. Right. We in the modern world, we're very good at superimposing. I believe that Hermann Levy, the Jewish conductor, who was the most famous conductor of Wagner's music while he was alive, has more of a valid perspective on Wagner than I do. You see, yeah. uh, what the hell do I know about Wagner? I, I, I'm living in 21st century America. I'm a cellist in the United States. I'm a podcast interview host in the United States. You're telling me that I have more of a right to judge Wagner's character than his friend, his protege, right. who was Jewish and knew him intimately? Uh, it's very strange. It's a very odd, it's an invalid, actually, way of, of moral supposition which i sure. refuse i refuse to accept that me superimposing my views my opinions onto we're using wagner as an example yeah. is more valid than all of the jews who were great exponents of his music during his lifetime and who loved him as a person that's ridiculous right i'd like to um change the topic here to an interesting thing that is brought up a lot in the article and i thought it was just kind of informative um to talk about the sort of culture of um, audience clapping, applause in classical music, which has been a subject of great, uh, um, been a sub- subject of great controversy for many years. And uh, exactly, every- exactly. How do you feel about clapping between movements? Let, let me let me say one thing before I answer that. 
which is, if you don't mind, I'm going to just rewind quickly because it's it's good to okay. get it in now before. I just want to read because I I, I, I mentioned earlier the Mr. Solemnis, the Chinese gentleman who was executed. I just want to read to you so people don't hear this and say, what was he talking about? Was he just bullshitting? No, uh, here we go. <laughs> this is uh, from a comment on one of the many people who shared my article on Facebook. Uh, this man is named Jeffrey Gao. He commented, my story really pales in comparison to what others endured during that period. And speaking of Beethoven, he was the favorite composer for maestro Lu Hong En, the former music director of the Shanghai Symphony. When Lu was jailed, tortured, and broken during the Cultural Revolution for his sins, in parentheses, being a Catholic and playing the elitist bourgeois music of Beethoven, all he had was Beethoven's music in his mind. The day when he was taken away for execution, he said this to his cellmate, who survived to tell his ordeal to the world. When this is all over, please travel to Vienna and lay a bouquet of flowers at Beethoven's grave and tell the maestro that his disciple in China was humming the Misa Solemnis when he was facing his murderer's rifle. If this does not exemplify Beethoven's music being inclusive and universal, I don't know what does. And I, I would just say to that moving quote, uh, Amen. Amen. Yeah. Now back to clapping. <laughs> back to clapping. <laughs> I, so, I, so, so, yeah. so clapping. So there's a lot of history here. We don't need to go through the whole history, but I will say that, that, in the same way that there are traditions associated with going to the symphony, like you're not supposed to cap, excuse me, you're not supposed to clap between movements, nor you're not supposed to cap either. They tell you to take those off before you go into it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, you're not supposed to talk or clap when you like something at a movie either. You know, when there's a great scene of the, the bad guys, you know, being, uh, put in jail or being captured and, and, and the good guys or the Americans in World War II in the movie when, when they when they kill the Nazis. You know, you're not supposed to cheer and go nuts in a movie theater. And no one accuses the movie theater of being elitist. Right. That's just sort of how it is. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to applaud, supposed to applaud between movements in the symphony. But somehow that is the most elitist offensive thing ever in, <laughs> in the history of all time. How dare yeah. you shush me when I try to applaud? OK, yeah. Now, that that being aside, I'm not at all bothered when when someone when someone applauds uh, much more bothered than than the average musician is the average audience member. Most audience members are offended when someone applauds and claps between movements who the hell ca do you really care that much i mean i mean i don't really care that much if there's a little applause you know two seconds of applause but before everybody starts shushing that's that's what makes a live concert so enjoyable it's different every night you know there's this whole big thing made of applause i swear in all the concerts i've played all over the world, I've never had someone come up to me afterwards and say, you know, I'm never coming back to this symphony because I can't clap between movements. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's a it, big, there's so much of a bigger overblown deal made about this whole applause thing as if, as if, again, the people like the pop music staff at Vox, these pop music writers are so-called musicologists who are who are purporting to see the elitism in orchestras. But really, by perpetuating actual elitist myths about orchestras, they're the elitist ones. Yeah. As if, as if, if the Boston Symphony said in big banners on the hall, clapping now encouraged between <laughs> movements, <laughs> The entire city of Boston, the whole region of New England would come running to Symphony Hall because they know <laughs> clapping is allowed. Yeah. What the hell planet are you on that this is yeah. an issue that is keeping people away? <laughs> really? It's ridiculous. These, it is ridiculous. I've used the word ridiculous a lot. Think about it. Clapping 
is now this the, the big thing that you can't clap. That's why we have 50% capacity at our concerts. Give me a freaking <laughs> break. I uh, think it's, I mean, everywhere has traditions, right? We don't know exactly where, like all our Christmas tree came from, right? These are ancient traditions. There are explanations for all of them, but really old traditions they arise due to a variety of factors and then we can like them or not, you know, but I think judging the tradition as arising organically over the course of centuries and, and just deciding it to lead us. And as you're saying, like that, it would make a demonstrable difference to the experience of classical music is, is pretty silly. Or, or, uh, or uh, let me, and just to put a finer point on it, or, or, or a demonstrable difference to the people and the quantity of people who are trying to go to <laughs> yeah. classical music concerts. Exactly. <laughs> I can think of many other reasons why people don't go than we can't clap between movements. Yes. By the way, by the way, so there, there was, there was, um, there was a, a comment in, in the article about dress. I, I, I don't know the last time that these pop music writers were at a classical music concert. There have not been dress codes at the symphony for I don't know how long. I I don't think in my lifetime I'm I'm 31 years old. I, I don't think there's ever been. A, I don't think there's been a dress code at a symphony that I know of. I I can name you about 500 restaurants that have dress codes. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know a single symphony that has a dress code. Maybe maybe on opening night gala, your the men are asked to wear a tie or something. Okay, right, fine. Right. Uh, I, I I'm not aware of this whole you need to dress to the nines thing. No, you don't. Yeah. I see people at orchestras all over the world. Germany, Shanghai, United States, where you see plenty of people in, in jeans and a shirt. People write me all the time. Here's another of the of the way they reverse the elitism. So they actually create elitism when it doesn't exist. Talking about clapping. Now, let me just put a finer point on the dress. Yeah. People say to me, if I give, let's say I give, I give my friend Timmy and Susie. The, he's a realtor and she's a bank. Okay, Timmy and Susie, they go to the orchestra once every two years. I say, here, Timmy and Susie, here's two tickets to come see Beethoven 5, because that's the only piece they want to say. They say, oh, okay, what's the dress code? What do you have to wear? I tell them, they say, what are you talking about? There's no dress code. Just, just come come comfortably. You'll wear anything you want. There's no, there's, no, there's no mysterious gatekeeper at the door <laughs> who's going to tell you, oh, you, you can't come in because you're not in a ball gown and you're not in white tie and tails. That's bullshit that's not how it works so come however the hell you want and then they write back and they say wait but i want to dress up that's what <laughs> makes it an experience i only go to the symphony once every two years they say the, the same way if i go to per se uh well there you actually do have to dress up but <laughs> but if you go to a nice restaurant that has no dress code you don't want to wear what you wear every other day maybe you want to do something a little nicer to make it an occasion that's normal that's not weird it's the people who actually see it as elitist who are telling other people it's elitist are the ones creating this myth when was the last right. time i would love them to say when the last time they went to a classical music right. concert <laughs> where, where where there was a dress code yeah i recently went to i think um it was Leonidas Cavacos gave a recital at Davies Symphony Hall. Incredible recital. And I went with a couple friends who are non-musicians. And I show up in jeans. And they look at me like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, sorry. Um, there you I, go. We came, I came from work. Or C Case in point. Case <laughs> 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 they wanted it to be the special symphony experience. People like dressing up. Anyway. Um, so um, I did a little research. I'm not going to go straight into it. We don't have to, but it's it suffice it to say that the tradition of not imp applauding between movements was um, really developed. Um, there were a couple um, instances where Mendelssohn and Schumann specified where they didn't want certain pieces having applause between movements, but the first composer presenter to um, formally declare that you will are not allowed to applaud. It was, surprise, surprise, Wagner at Bayreuth Festspielerhaus. And, um, you know, it was the sort of quasi-religious experience he wanted to have almost in complete darkness and no applause. So he was trying to go for a certain kind of effect. And then later in the 1900s, you had Mahler asking the same kind of things of his audience. But um, it, in Beethoven's time, there was applause between all movements, and that didn't change with him. 
it didn't change with him, and and it certainly wouldn't fix all the woes of the <laughs> classical music industry if <laughs> if it were printed on big banners and in all the programs. Please applaud as loudly as you can. Uh, so again, it's it, it's it's more myths, you know. Uh, th- th- there have to be more myth busters out there. It's just another yes. myth. I Absolutely. I wouldn't care. I wouldn't care if if suddenly tomorrow the protocol changed. And there were applause and courage as often as there is in a jazz show. I go to a lot of jazz, yeah. uh, top level jazz. If someone plays a good solo, you want to applaud, do it, do it. I don't care. You know, we're, we're there to share the music. Uh, where we are now is the protocol says that that we we do the traditional thing. Uh, but again, it's the people who don't have any connection to music, like the pop music staff at Vox who think they are the arbiters of uh, why classical music has big problems, which it does. <laughs> it does have big problems, but that's yeah. not one of them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to just ask you before we go, um, so you wrote the article, is is really wonderfully written. I thought um, um, I enjoyed the... Uh, the anecdotes of people from around the world in Japan and in Qatar and people all over who had these incredible personal experiences of listening to music. And um, I wanted to see what the kind of response has been on your end. It's been a very positive response. I, I do read all the comments and all the emails and I've had people writing uh, just the other day. I think yesterday I had an email from a clarinetist in Bulgaria, in Sofia in the orchestra, they're writing me, thanking me uh, for the article. But most of the people writing have not been musicians. Uh, uh, I think most of the people writing have been just people who love the piece, uh, people who love the piece, who want to be able to keep loving the piece. This is not uh, the, the worship of a text yeah. or an opera. This is the worship of great music. And as we all know, music is the great unifier, as I often say on my show, even more than food. And, you know, I was thinking, Joseph, of uh, I recently had on the former senator from North Dakota, Heidi Heidkamp. She was on my podcast, Talking Beats, and it's a great conversation. And she said, you know what? She really loves to do one of her favorite things is to bring Democrats and Republicans together in the small towns in North Dakota, where she lives, where she's from, Democrats helping Republicans hang their Christmas lights is, I thought that was a great image, is, is something she's big on doing. She works with Joe Donnelly, who was the former senator from Indiana, on on bringing people together in rural America. Uh, and it's I, I was thinking about music as she was saying that. I was thinking about how she's sitting down with uh, Republicans and Democrats hanging the Christmas lights. Uh, I thought, wow, isn't that what music does too? It it brings people together because the wonderful thing about a concert is that you're not asked for your religious affiliation, for your political affiliation as you enter the doors of the concert hall because music is supposed to take us away from all that. It's supposed to transport it's not a place where your background or your personal beliefs come into play. The doors are open for everybody. Classical music should be as accessible to everybody as possible. It is done a great disservice when pop music writers pretend like it's more exclusive than it is. Classical music right now is on the brink of a demise. It's on the brink of catastrophe. It's not elitist. It's barely holding on by a thread. And the only thing that's holding it together right now is the passion that hundreds of millions of people in this country and around the world have for pieces like Beethoven. That's what we need to keep in mind as we go forward. That's beautiful. I'm going to clip that. That's a, that's a clip. <laughs> well done. Um, I think, yeah, it's, um, as you said at the end of your article, the humanities have a way of protecting themselves. Beethoven doesn't need us to defend him. 
he is going to be fine on his own. <laughs> it's it's just sad to see when the discourse devolves um, to uh, this level just to score some. I don't even know if it's political. I don't even know what, oh, it's, what it's you gain. Some, gain I, it's, 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 it's called, it's called uh, to quote Charlie Sykes, the great political commentator who's been on my podcast, to quote Charlie Sykes, performative wokeness is what it's called. Uh, it's nothing more than that. It's a performance art. And and by the way, just to, to, uh, the last point I'll make is just about the humanities defending themselves. That came from a conversation I had with the legendary Walter Isaacson, who was on my podcast. I said... I said to Walter, because he, he is into writing about people who bring the sciences and the humanities together. Of course, Da Vinci is the prime exponent of this yeah. in human history. A melding of arts, humanities, with the sciences, with the maths. Uh, da Vinci, of course, was an expert in many fields. So I said to Walter, I said, Walter... Do the humanities, this is pre-virus, remember, do the humanities need staunch, outright loud defenders, you know, banging the drum and waving the, the sticks and the flags in the streets? And he said, no, he said, he said, they defend themselves. What are we talking about here? Beauty, music. And I wrote in the article, I said, you know, Walter, I think you were right then. I'm afraid you may be wrong now. <laughs> I think that's a good place to end it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Daniel. It was a pleasure. Thank you, mine.